There, you should be able to see my screen and you see the picture of Dr. Holland. Well, welcome everyone and good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this year's Holland Lecture, um, named uh, by uh, Lila Green. Uh, and uh, as you know, those of you who've been around a while, this lecture was established by Lila, who you see, who has joined us. Uh, and actually, this is a real advantage of COVID and Zoom, isn't it, Lila? Because maybe in, in person, it would be more difficult. So this year, we're, we're glad to have you with us. But Lila Holland Green established this to foster the memory of her late husband, Sidney Holland, who was a general neurosurgeon, a general cranial neurosurgeon, and widely thought of as one of the most talented neurosurgeons in his generation. Uh, and although he did everything, the vascular cases came to him because he was a very talented a surgeon dealing with tumors and, and all kinds of things. Uh, you can see his training here that uh, he completed the residency back in 1961. And um, uh, as you know, this is a fairly old residency. We're in our 75th year of the residency now. Uh, Dr. Holland continued as a traveling fellow in neuropathology um, and then in Queen, at Queen Square uh, and then at the Atkinson Morley's Hospital in England. And then he worked at Elmhurst uh, where he was director of the neurosurgery service and would do the, the difficult cases and bring the difficult cases here to Sinai. And, for, and sadly, he passed away in 1984. Um, but uh, Lila established this lecture uh, many, many years ago. And actually the first lecture was none other than M. Gazi Yassergill. Uh, since then we've become a bigger department and <clears throat> things are done in committees now. <clears throat> and here you can see uh, Lila that there's an entire Sydney A. Holland Memorial Lecture Committee dedicated to picking the best and the brightest uh, surgeons, uh, with a focus on vascular, but not always. And here you can see uh, members of the committee. Uh, there is a long line of Holland lecturers, beginning with Dr. Yassergill. And uh, Greg, you can see that you are following in the footsteps of some pretty heavy hitters here. Um, Ralph Dacey uh, was here in 2004. And I don't know if you joined him, but I, um, I, 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 were you here at that time? That was the year I joined uh, Wash U, 2004. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so you can see you've got a really great group of, of people uh, who have preceded you. And so uh, really fitting that you are, are rounding out this uh, here, um, which brings me to, to the introduction of Gregory Zipfel, who is the Ralph Dacey Distinguished Professor and Chair in the Department of Neurosurgery at Wash U in St. Louis. Um, Dr. Zipfel is a friend, uh, a personal friend that I've gotten to know over the years and a friend of the department with close ties to a number of, of our faculty. Um, as I mentioned, he's, he uh, stepped up as chair almost three years ago, um, and he is uh, now the neurosurgeon in chief and co-director of the Vascular Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital. You can see his outstanding training uh, from University of Illinois, Northwestern, University of Florida, and fellowships. Um, and uh, he has taken over a wonderful, highly accomplished department. Uh, he is an academic neurosurgeon and is devoted to fostering research, grants, science, uh, and the people who do it. Uh, we were chatting last night about our trials and tribulations of really maintaining our funding and, and increasing funding. Uh, right now, his department is number 10 in the United States for federal funding. Um, and Greg himself has over 250 pub personal public publications in peer-reviewed journals. He's chaired the major uh, the major societies 
Uh, and so it's it's no uh, no surprise uh, that he was chosen by the committee. So with this, Greg, I will stop the share and uh, turn it over to you. We look forward to your talk today. Great, thanks, uh, Josh, for the uh, great in introduction, and uh, really am pleased to be here. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. <laughs> We're okay. Okay. Uh, pleased to be here uh, uh, to be the, the 32nd Holland lecturer. That's a very uh, big honor for me. And uh, as Dr. Pedersen said, that um, you know I have a lot of connections and friendships here um, that make this uh, particularly uh, special. So thank you very much, uh, and thank you to uh, Mrs. Green for uh, uh, being with us today uh, and establishing this lectureship uh, 32 years ago. So, so, so it's wonderful to be with you. Uh, let me share my screen, hopefully. Can someone confirm that that's in uh, presenter mode? That everything looks good. Good, looks good. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be talking about three three different topics. Uh, it's kind of my favorite topics to to talk about. Uh, one is the clinical management of uh, of brain aneurysms, and I just have a few comments and observations and uh, things that we've uh, been participating in that I that like to share with you today. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, dural arteriovenous fistulas, and so we'll share some uh, recent data coming out of a consortium that we started uh, a few years ago, but are coming to fruition with uh, now, I believe, eight or nine publications that have come out uh, in the last year or so. I'll, sh I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll end with uh, some of the more basic uh, research that I'm doing in my laboratory that has to do with trying to develop novel therapies for uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, I don't have any uh, industry funding or, or, or disclosures or conflicts of interest. Uh, I do have research funding, uh, and, and this a lot of this will be related to the laboratory work I'll share at the end of the talk. Um, I just want to, uh, again, acknowledge uh, some really close and, and great friendships that I've developed with a, a number of Mount Sinai uh, faculty that you see listed here. Uh, it's wonderful to come back uh, uh, in these uh, uh, type of venues. It's nice to be back in person, uh, have dinner with uh, some of you last night, and uh, it really is just a treat to, to be back. Uh, I tried to express this last night with a few of the residents uh, I'll try again today, uh, but I, I really believe there's something special uh, about being in academic neurosurgery um, that, uh, you know, we're all fighting our own uh, battles, uh, trying to do the best for our patients, trying to advance science, trying to advance uh, the education of the next generation. And there's kind of cer certain types of, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges and, and, and successes and, and triumphs that you can, uh, that you, you, you develop over time in, with that pursuit. But it's something that you can really share personally and deeply with people who are doing something very similar, just in a different part of the country. And so I think in academics, you develop deep relationships with people who are similarly minded as you. And it's something that is one additional thing to think about as you're trying to do your long term planning uh, and something that I, really I cherish uh, within academic neurosurgery. So I'll just start with the uh, with the first person. Uh, let me make sure I can move this forward here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so Saudi. May, I don't know if he's with us today, but uh, he may or may not, he probably does not remember this, but I, I remember this very well. Um, I, I did a sub-I at, at University of Washington, and he was the fourth year medical student um, who ultimately matched at University of Washington for his training. And, uh, you know, it's, it's intimidating to go at the time, you know, I viewed as one of the best programs, if not the best training program in the country. Um, and knowing that there's, you know, another 20 or 30 students coming through uh, uh, that, that program at the time as a sub-I, it was intimidating for me and people like Saudi. Turns out uh, Jerry Grant, uh, uh, if you know that name, is the new chair at Duke, uh, was the first year uh, uh, resident. Michael Haglin was the, uh, ch uh, the chief uh, uh, and now is at Duke as well. So these kind of relationships, but Saudi really uh, took a personal interest in me and was very kind to me and made me feel at home. Uh, so I wanted to thank him for that. Dr. Bettison, uh, 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 if, you, if you go back, it turns out uh, uh, we, you and I really became uh, uh, kind of acquainted and, and then developed a, a really a nice friendship uh, during the CV section days. And um, he was the chair of the CV section in 2008, which turns out is the very first year that I had any official role in the CV section. I was asked to be part of the scientific program committee and uh, it kind of went from there. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity that you and others gave me in the CV section, uh, you know, a while ago, and and uh, and something that I really cherish my time in the CV section, uh, as I know Jay and Chris and others uh, uh, do as well. 
Uh, Jay, I have a lot of connections with Jay. Uh, I, I try to figure out exactly where those connections came from. Um, it really, I think, started when he took his first job at the University of Florida. I, I trained there. Um, we didn't cross paths there, but, uh, but I'm very close with uh, the, the department, with a lot of the faculty there. And when Jay joined Brian Ho and others uh, at University of Florida, I think that was my first introduction to Jay. And we quickly became friends. A uh, number of different uh, roles together in the CV section. Um, um, and, and then we all have written, uh, I told the 12 papers together in, in, in different type of writing groups, but it really was the CV section uh, where uh, Jay and I kind of grew up together uh, following uh, Dr. Betterson and others. Um, and it turns out I became the chair of the section in 2018, and then Jay was the, 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 the president or the chair uh, in 2019. So he followed me. So those days were wonderful and something I really cherish. I know Jay couldn't be here today with a family commitment. Um, we're actually, Jay's coming back to be our uh, uh, special uh, uh, keynote lecturer uh, uh, this coming year. So uh, I'll see him then, but uh, uh, another good connection there. there. Uh, uh, Dr. Haja Panayas, Costas and I uh, uh, have known each other for quite some time. Um, pretty sure this, this occurred right around 2016 where I was asked to start leading the, the, uh, S, the Senior Society, the Society for Neurological Surgeons intern boot camps and, and resident courses. Um, uh, nationally. So when I started doing that, Costas was very involved with that uh, at Emory. And that's where we kind of cross paths and become very friendly uh, since that time. He also is very involved with the K-12 career development program that I'm inv involved with. And uh, it's great to see Costas again. And then more recently, Chris and uh, Raj, uh, I've gotten to know them. Uh, and I don't exactly know, I, I think it's probably friends of Jay uh, is probably how that happened. Uh, but it's been really a pleasure getting to know both of you over the last few years and uh, uh, including this uh, recent dinner in, uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, where uh, I went out with a New York, I'm pretty sure everybody there is from New York, except for me, uh, but somehow uh, I was included, which I appreciated. So it's great to be part of this uh, uh, community. And it's really a real honor to be uh, the, the Holland lecturer this year, 32 years of this, just that alone kind of puts, puts it in a special uh, framework, uh, coming back with friends that makes it special. Uh, I know uh, I've heard uh, really nice things about Dr. Holland last night at dinner about uh, what he meant to uh, Mount Sinai, what he meant to the New York community and, and his patients and his prowess as a neurosurgeon and especially as a vascular neurosurgeon. Uh, I couldn't, I didn't have the list at the time, but I, I did figure out through the internet, you know, who else, had, at least some of the people who've been the Holland lecturer and I feel very privileged to be part of this uh, esteemed group. So with that, I'll move on. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, aneurysms as you see listed here or, or pictured here, basal tip aneurysm and a, and a patient who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're gonna talk about uh, uh, management of brain aneurysms. Fistulas like this anterior fossa floor, duralevi fistula with this, a large ectatic draining vein, how to manage those and data that will drive that. And then uh, something that uh, I have spent a lot of time on uh, is conditioning. Uh, and I'll talk more about it, but the conditioning agent we use primarily has been hypoxia. So I'll talk about that. Um, aneurysms, let's talk first there. So, you know, when I was uh, coming up as a resident uh, and fellow, and when I went to meetings, there was a lot about uh, clip versus coil uh, and us versus them. Uh, we're better, they're better. It, it was a very, it was kind of contentious and you can Im imagine why, mainly interventional neuroradiology uh, uh, was bringing uh, clipping, uh, I'm sorry, bringing coiling and endovascular techniques to to the to the to the uh, to the patients and to the to the field, and surgeons had gone through a lot of uh, effort to improve and advance their technique and and develop these uh, uh, ways of, of treating difficult problems. And so you can imagine that emotionally, both were tied to it. But what I'm happy to say is that over time, what used to be a, a us versus them has now very much become a collaboration across the world. Um, certainly, I know that's happening at Mount Sinai. It's happening at Wash U. Uh, it's clip coil or combination. We need to do it as a team, and we need to do it in a collaborative spirit. I have a wonderful team, um, myself, Dr. Osbin, um, and uh, a new member, Dr. Valimina, uh, uh, are our uh, 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 vascular neurosurgeons, uh, Josh and Ananth are dual trained. Uh, we have two now interventional neurologists, uh, 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 Rano and Chris Moran, uh, uh, Rano Chatterjee, uh, who are wonderful uh, to work with. And then we have a new interventional stroke neurologist, uh, Brendan Ebi, uh, who is heading up a, a thrombectomy stroke center at one of our community hospitals and also caring for patients at Barnes. So we have a wonderful team, important to have that team. Um, and I think uh, the team is necessary or, Im or important in, in treating difficult uh, uh, cerebrovascular conditions. So one point I wanted to make in terms of uh, uh, aneurysm treatment is that not everything should be coiled. I know a lot, a lot are being coiled, a lot are being treated endovascular, but I think there are still uh, many cases that need to be done open. This is an example of that. 
This is a 50 year old woman who presented with a pretty rapid decline in her vision over six months. Um, she could only count fingers in her right eye and had 2200 vision in her left eye. And, and the, the cause of that problem was this, uh, a large uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm, putting pressure on the optic uh, chiasm and optic uh, nerves. You can see uh, a, a small right A1 filling it from the right, a larger A1 filling it from the left. And uh, you, you, you could consider some endovascular uh, management of this, uh, but we were very convinced that uh, uh, open surgery to decompress the optic apparatus and give her a best chance of uh, improving her vision uh, would be uh, uh, most appropriate. So we took her to surgery. This is the operative view um, coming uh, uh, from the left. Um, it was a team game. I actually had the interventional uh, 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 colleagues uh, uh, um, endovascular uh, coil the right A1. So then I would then I operatively I thought I would have complete control uh, of the most of the proximal flow as well as distal flow uh, in, in this view, knowing that the contralateral A1 would not be in view until the very end of the procedure. So I, we worked together on that. Um, we then uh, uh, did a, a, a trapping and suction decompression technique to get the uh, uh, pressure off the optic chiasm and to create room for clipping. Uh, did a tandem um, clipping technique uh, uh, due to the size of this aneurysm, including fenestrating uh, the, the ipsilateral A1. Um, here's a second clip uh, uh, going on for uh, a, a neck remnant. Um, and the final uh, uh, post-op angio looked like this, which I thought looked quite good, including the uh, coils of the right A1 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is an example that uh, uh, surgery is required for uh, uh, certain types of aneurysms, but you still can work together as a team uh, to, to do the best job with that surgery. Uh, a happy story with this particular uh, patient, uh, her, her vision got dramatically better over the, over the next few months uh, to the point where she was back to working as a librarian, back to working and had very good vision in both eyes despite her initial deficits. This is an example where I think a team uh, approach really matters. Uh, this is a patient who typically we would have uh, clipped uh, initially uh, for the treatment, uh, given that this pica aneurysm really is a pica aneurysm, not a vertebral pica aneurysm because the, the dome or the neck of this aneurysm comes right off the takeoff of the pica. She presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the problem is she had a neurogenic cardiomyopathy with an EF, something like 10 or 15%. And we just didn't think that she would be up for a long uh, 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 far lateral skull base approach for clipping of this aneurysm. Um, um, so at the same time, we wanted to preserve her pica and avoid a ischemic stroke. So I had my interventional colleagues uh, coil the dome of the bigger uh, uh, lobe of this aneurysm which we felt was the likely the uh, source of the hemorrhage, let her get through her cardiomyopathy to a point where we could take her to surgery for definitive clipping. About 10 days after her uh, presentation, her uh, uh, cardiac function had improved uh, and we took her back to the operating room for definitive clipping, uh, fixing the aneurysm altogether and also maintaining uh, uh, pica patency. So example of working together to get a good outcome. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is the opposite of that. This is uh, a patient that I, initially treated surgically, but then needed endovascular uh, help. Um, this is a 16 year old who presented with a seizure, unruptured aneurysm, uh, but had uh, this fusiform aneurysm off the, the uh, uh, temporal M2 with a large branch coming out of the dome and just no endovascular options that could take care of the aneurysm, but maintain patency of that large branch. We took him to surgery and did a bypass, STA MCA bypass to that branch and then clip reconstruction of that fusiform aneurysm. And things look pretty good. Uh, after surgery, I was, I was happy about that. The patient was doing well. Uh, but a year later, uh, um, this uh, uh, fusiform aneurysm was recurring. And the key points here are a fusiform aneurysm is more likely to recur after clip reconstruction than a saccular aneurysm. And kids, he was 16, have a higher chance of recurrence. And so we're very vigilant about uh, follow-up angiograms, especially in those scenarios in the early uh, period of time after surgery. We had a discussion with him and his family about uh, taking him back to surgery for another bypass. Uh, a high flow bypass with trapping the entire M2 segment with a radial artery uh, to uh, revascularize. But pipeline stenting was coming uh, online and uh, we, we elected to have that uh, stented uh, with a pipeline that you see here. And he's now uh, actually uh, graduated college. This was several many years ago and doing very well. And this has been stable for many, many years. So an example where surgery was necessary early but endovascular help at the end was necessary. This is the opposite of that. This is the fastest growing aneurysm I've seen. Um, it didn't start with me, but it ended up with me. Uh, this started as a three millimeter fusiform aneurysm of the temporal M2, uh, quickly over a year and a half grew to this size, was treated endovascularly by uh, uh, outside uh, uh, physicians. And you can see the initial result 
which looked, you know, so, you know, reasonable, not great, but reasonable. Obviously some still filling at the neck. Um, patient was sent uh, to me uh, a couple years later when she had a, a major recurrence of this uh, fusiform aneurysm. This um, aneurysm was now about three centimeters in size, a lot of thrombus coils, but a, a major recurrence at the base. We talked about whether endovascular options were possible, but the, the acuteness of this turn up to the M2 was felt to be uh, not ideal at all for a pipeline stent, for example. So this is an example where it started with coiling, but ended up with a uh, uh, trapping uh, and a radial artery uh, bypass for revascularization. So the point of all that is just a few examples is that this is a team game. Um, you need to have great, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 surgeons who are uh, adept with uh, microvascular surgery. Uh, you need to work closely with your inter interventional colleagues who may be your neurosurgery colleagues, radiologists or neurologists, uh, but you need to have a good uh, working relationship so to, to take care of uh, these complicated uh, conditions uh, in, in, a, in an ideal way. So it's a team game. A few, a few comments about uh, how to optimize uh, uh, outcomes after surgical management of aneurysms. And I'm gonna focus in on uh, use of intraoperative assessment tools. Um, this is the, the Doppler, uh, which can give you velocity through uh, uh, branches and, and parent vessels. This is the, uh, the Charbel flow probe uh, named after Fadi Charbel, who's a past Holland lecturer. Um, twice it looked like on that list, actually, I noticed. Um, and he developed this flow probe, which actually, instead of giving velocity, gives quantitative flow through uh, blood vessels. And I like this tool a lot. You can also use endoscopy to look around corners to make sure that the, uh, the clip blades are across the aneurysm neck or there's no perforators involved with the clip blades. Uh, occasionally can be used. Uh, I'm sure you see this a lot, uh, frequently using intraoperative uh, video angiography, either uh, um, ICG, which is what this is, or fluorescein can be very useful. And then the gold standard in my mind is still intraoperative catheter angiography, as you see here. But there, so we have many tools. Uh, none of them hit all the, all the buckets of what you really need in terms of uh, uh, optimizing uh, intraoperative uh, 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 efficacy of your, of your surgery. Here, are the, 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 in my mind, the things that you're trying to assess with these intraoperative tools, assessment tools. One is you wanna make sure the aneurysm is completely obliterated. You wanna make sure that the parent and branch vessels are open. You wanna make sure that perforators in the area are open. You'd like to know that immediately so you can make adjustments to your clip uh, without uh, in, incurring any uh, ischemia time. And preferably in terms of flow, you, you'd like to have a quantitative rather than a qualitative measure like, like uh, velocity. Um, none of the tools address all these. And so I'll talk at the end about my recommendations or at least what I'd like to do uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, using these tools uh, in a kind of a multimodal way. We've done some work looking at uh, some of these tools, and I just thought I'd share a couple of those. Uh, this is an article that we wrote quite a, a, a while ago looking at uh, whether you need to do intraoperative angiography on all patients uh, for assessment or whether there's a, a select group of patients where you know that the angiography is not going to uh, help you in any kind of way, uh, more you know, simpler aneurysms, for example, that uh, a simple clipping uh, would be effective along with ICG as, a, as, a, as an adjunct. And so we did a, we did a, a study. We, we prospectively evaluated about 200 uh, cases, uh, aneurysm patients done by several different surgeons, and uh, all the patients got intraoperative angiography. So they all got the intraoperative angio. But the point was, did that, was that required? Did we need an intraoperative angio on all those? Or could we predict, could the surgeon predict what patients wouldn't need it? It wouldn't be useful. And so what we did is we did a, um, a, uh, 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 an assessment uh, at the time uh, prior to the surgery, prior to going to the operating room, we asked the surgeon, based on what imaging and the, and the situation, do you need an intraoperative angiogram or not? Would it be useful or not? And then they would answer yes or no. And then after surgery, after clipping, but before uh, the intraoperative angiogram was done in the operating room, we asked again, uh, you know, based on what you saw intraoperatively and how well the clip went on, did you see calcification? Did you see atheroma? Are you worried about a branch or a perforator? you know, do you need this intraoperative angiogram or not? And they would answer yes or no. And then the intraoperative angiogram would be done. And we looked and, we, and the main thing was, were there misses? Were there times where a surgeon thought either preoperatively or intraoperatively, I got it, the aneurysm's great, uh, it's fixed and, and, and the parent and branch vessels are patent and, and things look good. Or were there times where the surgeon was wrong and missed uh, the need for an angio? Uh, and the bottom line is uh, the surgeons missed. Uh, not a lot, but they missed enough and, 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 the, and the significances of the misses to, to us were such that it really supports the use of a routine use of intraoperative angiography rather than uh, in select cases only when the surgeon thinks it's necessary. 
Uh, another area that we that was coming online was well maybe this ICG like I showed you or fluorescein which came out later um, could replace interoperative angiography and there were studies like this coming out in the early in the mid 2000s and late 2000s that suggested especially the later studies that the concordance the the agreement between the ICG and the post op catheter angiogram were really really good and so, and maybe we don't need interoperative angiograms at all because we have ICG and then later fluorescein. But we saw cases like this um, that suggested otherwise. This is a, a large ICA uh, terminus aneurysm that went for uh, surgery. Um, and, uh, and when we did the surgery, um, we saw this. Uh, we're on the right side. Uh, uh, this is the right A1 here. This will be the right uh, M1 here. The ICA terminus is here and the aneurysm is here. And you can see the clip dates kind of in, in shadow form here. So the aneurysm has been clipped. And then we looked in the depths, we, we felt that we saw the ICA and it was filling. And so we interpreted this as a, a, a good clipping uh, with parent, uh, a pat patent parent and branch vessels. The catheter angiogram, however, suggested otherwise. Uh, it turns out that uh, beyond the clip blades, the ICA was uh, occluded. And what we were seeing uh, as patency in the right ICA actually was collateral flow. Uh, and we went back and fixed this, uh, and, uh, but it's just an example of a discordance between what we saw in ICG and what we saw in the intraoperative angiogram. And this concerned us that uh, uh, perhaps ICG can't replace intraoperative angiography. So we did a study on that, um, uh, uh, and we looked at about 50 patients. All patients had aneurysm surgery. Uh, they all had an intraop angiogram done, and they all, all uh, also had ICG done. And we looked at the concordance between the ICG in the angiography. And this is a little different than what had already been published because the assessment was uh, uh, intraoperative angiography, not post-op. Um, and it allows you to kind of ha have your best opportunity to change the clip. And so the, the definition of a discordance that was sig clinically significant was that we went back after the intraoperative angiogram and changed the clip. Uh, um, and we found that eight times, four times because there was remnants of the aneurysm, four times because of parent or branch vessel uh, occlusions. And it meant that the ICG to us in our hands uh, was wrong 16% of the time, enough that we would go back and change the clip. This was particularly uh, 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 common in areas like the anterior communicating area or the basilar area, deeper fields with uh, kind of more limited views. And it also was common in areas where uh, the, the, uh, the aneurysm was outside the field of view. So for example, the superior apophyseal artery aneurysm, the, the, the ICA is in between you, the surgeon, and the aneurysm. And uh, whether you have any, a neck remnant by ICG is difficult because the ICA is, is uh, uh, obscuring your view. And to us, it, this was a kind of study that also uh, uh, suggested that intraoperative angiography should be done routinely. And what was interesting, when we, once we published this, the number of prominent, well-known vascular neurosurgeons, probably some of those who were on that Holland lecture list, uh, came up and said, we have the same experience where ICG and fluorescein is not uh, synonymous with uh, uh, what you see with uh, an intraoperative angiography. And so I think that a judicious use of, or, 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 or frequent use, if not routine use of intraoperative angiography would be my recommendation. So with that, I'll go back to the tools. Um, we have these five tools and we have these five things we're trying to achieve. I, I think, I, I, hopefully you understand now that not all of these uh, uh, ideal uh, assessments can be done with uh, one uh, technique. So really you need to use a combination. What I like to use frequently is the flow probe for quantitative flow, especially in, in branch vessels that I think may be obscured uh, or obstructed by uh, the clip that would be applied. I, I complement that with uh, ICG or fluorescein or both. And then we always do intraoperative angiography on virtually every patient uh, because I do think uh, uh, the other tools will miss things and uh, this is our best way to get the best outcome. I think we'll see, save questions and things to the end. So I'll just move on to the second part of the talk which relates to fistulas. And I'm going to talk a lot about this. Uh, this is uh, something that we call CONDOR, uh, International Consortium for Dural AV Fistula Outcome Research. Uh, this is a, a, a multi-site uh, 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 consortium, uh, mainly based in North America with a few sites uh, throughout the world. You see a lot of the di different players uh, here. And uh, this has been a, a, a kind of a labor of love uh, uh, for all these places to participate. Uh, there's no funds. This is not a funded study at this point, something that we're looking towards doing in the future. So really this is uh, everybody kind of uh, uh, finding ways to get us the data that we needed to create this consortium. But we thought it was important because Durley officials are so rare that any one site is only gonna have, see you know, a handful of these, or maybe if you're lucky, 10 or 20 of these a year. 
Uh, but that's just very low volume uh, to be able to make uh, important observations in terms of how to handle these uh, lesions and, and understanding them better. Uh, we reported this uh, uh, consortium uh, in, in JNS. Uh, it's actually online since April, but it has not been in print. It'll, it'll come out in April uh, in print, which is frustrating, but I guess we're getting there. Um, and uh, our, our consortium now is at over 1,000 patients. 16 centers have participated. Um, you can see the years that these patients were accrued. And we have 153 individual clinical and radiographic variables on every one of these patients. So a really robust, unique uh, data set to do uh, interesting studies. I'm going to share two of those with you that I think can help guide uh, management of dural AV fistulas. Both are from uh, uh, University of Virginia and Jason Sheehan. They're similarly uh, designed, so I'll go through the details of how it was designed for the first study and then kind of quickly go through the second study. The first study was uh, uh, looking at low-grade dural AV fistulas, and what low-grade means is a borden shukart 2, or I'm sorry, borden shukart one fistula, which means it does not have cortical venous drainage. There's a fistula, the fistula is in the dura, it can drain uh, 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 arterial blood into the sinus, but, it's, but there's no arterialized blood going into a cortical vein, uh, and therefore, uh, according to natural history studies, including some from Wash U, have a very low risk of causing uh, hemorrhage or seizure or, or, or non-hemorrhagic neurological deficits. And then the question here is, should they be treated? And so uh, this is an example, this is an artist rendition of that. Uh, around the uh, tentorial, uh, I'm mean, sorry, uh, the sigmoid uh, 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 transverse sinus uh, junction, occipital artery, transosseous feeders going right into the sinus, but not involving a cortical vein. That's a type one uh, or a low grade fistula. The question is, should we be treating these? Because we know that their natural history is very low. You can see here uh, a review that we wrote uh, in, in terms of what the annual uh, uh, event rate, mortality rate uh, was, and it's very benign lesion. Um, so what what we did is we used the, the Condor database. We took all those type one fistulas, 230 of those had been treated, 125 had been observed. Uh, we did include CC fistulas in that group. And then we looked at uh, primary and secondary outcome. Uh, the primary outcome was, was functional outcome by a modified Rankin scale. Secondary in, uh, endpoints, which are important in this study, good functional outcome, symptom improvement. So the reason that type one fistulas are treated largely are for symptoms. And so you want to know, uh, did intervention help with the symptoms? And you also want to understand uh, uh, neurologic outcome, and you want to see if the uh, fish load was cured. Then we did a couple of different analyses, unmatched, but also an, a matched uh, uh, cohort. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the results from that analysis here shortly. So with the unmatched cohort, all comers, um, uh, there was no difference in any of the pri primary or any of the secondary outcome measures, including symptom resolution except for angiographic cure. If you treated the lesion, you were more likely to cure it. But otherwise, you're, it was no, uh, the functional outcomes were similar. The uh, symptom out, uh, outcome was similar. Uh, and there was uh, significant uh, uh, periprocedural uh, uh, complications and some neurologic risk that I'll talk about here in a second. Well, you say, well, it's unmatched. You know, maybe you're, 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 you're losing, it in, in, you know, losing it in the weeds. If you do a propensity match cohort, uh, so you're uh, comparing um, you know, more like-to-like -like, uh, uh, types of fistulas. Maybe that's where you'll see the difference. But, and again, we did not see a difference in any of the primary or secondary outcome measures, except for angiographic cure. Um, and then if you look at just those who were symptomatic, well, maybe those are the patients that really uh, uh, would be helped. But again, even with the secondary outcome measure like symptom resolution, there was not a, statist a statistically significant improvement in those that were treated and those that were not. And you might ask why. And the answer is probably combination. One is some of these fistulas will, will spontaneously resolve, either they'll thrombose completely or their the flow dynamics will change and their symptoms will improve spontaneously. So some patients who are not treated will, will have resolution of their symptoms. And the other thing is uh, uh, treatment doesn't always resolve the symptoms. You can, you can reduce flow, but the, but the tinnitus uh, remains. And the bottom line is we didn't see an improvement in symptoms uh, with, uh, with intervention. And there was a significant procedural complication rate, 19%. That includes groin hematomas and things that people get over quickly, but permanent neurologic morbidity happened in about 2.5% of patients, which is not inconsequential. So I think the, the bottom line with this uh, uh, initial analysis, now there's holes, it's, it's, it's a retrospective analysis. These patients were randomized into the same groups. There was probably you know, selection bias and things of that nature. But this study to us suggests that we need to be more cautious likely uh, with how, how many patients we are offering treatment for when they are low grade and truly only treat those that have intractable symptoms that are life altering in terms of uh, uh, the impact on their life. And they need to understand that there are some risks, as I stated. So 
more to come on this, but I think some additional caution with type one fistula is, uh, is important. Now they did the same study, the same analysis on type two and three fistulas. And these are lesions that have cortical venous drainage, either involvement of a sinus and a draining vein or a draining vein uh, only. And these are the high grade lesions and there's good natural history studies. And this is a summary of this. <clears throat> if you have a type two and three fistula and you present uh, without any symptoms at all, it's just by chance it's been identified or you have tinnitus, but you don't have hemorrhage, you don't have seizure, you don't have focal deficits. The natural history of that is about one and a half percent neurologic event rate per year, which is significant. Now, if it presents with aggressive symptoms, then the natural history is very poor and, uh, and treating these patients aggressively and early is important. Um, and then the other area that's been identified with type two and three fistulas in terms of natural history has been ectatic veins. Like I meant, showed you on the very first anterior fossa floor fistula. When you have an ectatic uh, uh, arterialized vein, likely there's an uh, outflow obstruction and those lesions uh, have been shown to have increased risk. So uh, we should be treating a lot of, lots of these, uh, but this study wanted to kind of uh, provide some additional data in terms of whether we should be treating these. And, and in particular, wanted to focus in on the unruptured uh, uh, high-grade fistulas. These are patients that didn't present with hemorrhage uh, and maybe in that lower risk uh, uh, category, should we be treating those patients? And, that, and the same kind of analysis was done, use the Condor database, almost all of them had been treated, but there was about 30 that had not been treated. And so that was the observation arm. Uh, the same type of primary and secondary endpoints, matched and unmatched uh, types of propensity, uh, uh, matched and unmatched uh, statistical analyses. And here are the results. And these are different than the first study I showed you. These very much support that these lesions should be treated. The angiographic cure rate was higher in those that were treated. Um, the mortality was lower in those that were treated. The ma majorities were treated with embolization. So a lot of it uh, uh, in terms of statistics goes towards the embolization group. But those that were treated uh, had a lower mortality, higher rate of cure, lower hemorrhage rate. And, and, and it very much suggested that treating even unruptured type two and three fistulas is the right thing to do for these patients. Um, it's particularly the case for embolization um, and uh, really does support what is, a, what is really a kind of a standard of care at this point. If you have a type two and three fistula, even if unruptured, most of these patients should be treated. So those are just two, two studies from Condor I thought I'd share with you. I, I thought I'd close on the fistula component of this talk with what I believe are, are, are the appropriate treatment uh, uh, recommendations for, for the different types of fistulas. For the type one fistulas that do not have cortical venous drainage, they do not, they have a very benign natural history. And now with this data that suggests that uh, intervention may not be as good as we thought it might be, I really think we need to be treating only those patients who have intractable symptoms that are life altering. And we need to talk to patients and their families uh, as such. Um, in one important point, if you have a type one fistula and you're observing it and there's any change in symptoms, whether the, the tinnitus gets worse or it spontaneously resolves, any change in symptom, positive or negative, does need to be evaluated with angiography because that can be a sign that, it, that a, it, it, it was cured and that happens, but also it could be a sign that it upgraded uh, or upconverted to a higher grade fistula that would have a worse natural history. So if there's a change in symptoms and you're observing a type one fistula, angiography would be important to do. I didn't talk much about CC fistulas and it's something that we wanna uh, focus in on with the uh, Condor database and, and, and subsequent studies will be coming from that. But I did wanna to touch on it in terms of a recommendation. And the bottom line is, although the type one fistula is technically, uh, the morbidity associated with ophthalmoplegia with CC fistulas is significant to, to where observing these I think is not reasonable at this point. And most of these patients, if not all, should be treated because of the morbidity associated with the ophthalmoplegia from CC fistulas. Type two and three fistulas, those that present aggressively with hemorrhage or like a patient like this who presented with seizures and some focal deficits from the perilesional uh, uh, edema. These patients have a bad natural history and they should be treated aggressively and really should be treated early. If I see a patient like this in clinic uh, who presented with a seizure, for example, I'll admit them the next day, the next day or so, have an angiogram and, and get them treated within a couple of days of, of presentation. It's not a, a pure elective thing. Uh, because of the poor natural history that's been documented. If they have venous ectasia like this, uh, uh, whether they present with aggressive symptoms or benign symptoms also should be treated ag uh, aggressively and I think early, uh, either with endovascular therapy or surgical therapy. Uh, and so that's another uh, recommendation for early treatment. It's really these, the type two and three fistulas that present without venous ectasia, without uh, uh, aggressive symptoms. What do you do there? And I think the data suggests that they should be treated in most patients, but it can be done electively. They can be, you know, have time for discussions, 
You can have your angiogram uh, uh, and in elective fashion, these can be treated. And there are select patients, I believe, people who are particularly old uh, or medically infirm, uh, that maybe the risks of endovascular surgical treatment are, are, are too much uh, for that particular scenario. Um, and uh, given the, the risk being about 1.5% per year, you may elect to either observe it or use radiosurgery, which takes two to three years uh, for the cure to occur. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears last into a, a, a lab mode here. We're gonna go into uh, uh, some uh, things that I've been doing with conditioning-based therapy uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, in particular, focusing in on trying to reduce uh, vasospasm, delayed cerebral ischemia, and more recently, we've been looking at how conditioning-based therapy can also reduce early brain injury. And all those things I just mentioned are important in terms of long-term outcome after aneurysmal rupture. So just to orient you, uh, uh, um, you know, if you have an aneurysm rupture, here's the aneurysm, it ruptures and causes a subarachnoid hemorrhage at the base of the brain. That hemorrhage itself uh, causes global ischemia temporarily and can lead to neuronal cell death itself. So the hemorrhage itself, before anything, can start to uh, create pathways leading to neuronal cell death and can impact long-term outcome after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But in addition, there are secondary brain injury pathways that are in play. One is called early brain injury, EBI, and that's a combination of blood-brain barrier breakdown, uh, neuroinflammation from astrocytosis, microgliosis, cytokine release, that leads to a neuroinflammatory process that in the first day, two or three after the subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can get global cerebral edema uh, that is increasingly being appreciated and is a significant contributor to neuronal cell death and long-term in income uh, outcome uh, deficits, which are primarily cognitive in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. And then later than one to three days for EBI is delayed cerebral ischemia, uh, with, uh, it, which is a multifactorial process that really develops four to 12 days after subarachnoid hemorrhage with the peak being seven to 10 days. And it's a combination of large artery vasospasm, microvessel thrombosis, and an inability uh, for the cerebral arterioles to regulate uh, as necessary. And the combination of EBI, the initial hemorrhage, and DCI is what leads to you know, uh, widespread neuronal cell death uh, leading to long-term uh, cognitive deficits in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that's what we're trying to defeat or trying to, to, to uh, address. And the EBI and the DCI are our, really our opportunities for therapeutic management. So we use conditioning um, and uh, with that, the, the technical term for that is an exposure to a non-harmful stress like hypoxia, like uh, inhalational agents, uh, 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 like ischemia uh, and other agents. Uh, so it's a non-harmful stress um, and, and attenuates the severity of a subsequent injury enhances reparative processes. So that's a lot of words and you gotta kind of think about that for a little bit. It's easier if you just think uh, like Nietzsche and say, what does not kill him makes him stronger. And we're trying to you know, capitalize on uh, epigenetic and genetic uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 pathways that are built into uh, uh, our, uh, our, our, you know, the human body within the brain, within neurons, within vascular cells, within uh, glia. Uh, and tap into those reparative and protective uh, processes uh, to uh, kind of reduce the subsequent injury that's coming, EBI and DCI. That's the idea. I, I can't, I, I, it kind of came to me in terms of maybe doing this uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients as I listened to a friend of mine, Dr. Gaday, Jeff Gaday, who was at WashU at the time, talk about using conditioning for protection of ischemia. And he was making the point that uh, although the, the field was concentrating mostly on the impact of conditioning on neurons, Turns out uh, there's a protective uh, uh, response in glia and in vessels. And it was the vascular part that really caught my eye because I knew that EBI and DCI are often very much tied to vascular pathology like vasospasm, blood brain barrier breakdown, uh, autoregulatory dysfunction, microvessel uh, uh, thrombi. And I'm like, well, if conditioning can uh, pr protect the vessels, maybe it can protect against these vascular mediated uh, 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 injury pathways after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we started with one of the more uh, common and uh, powerful uh, conditioning agents, hypoxia. This is a proof of principle. We know we're not gonna be uh, subjecting patients to hypoxia, but we thought if, we under, if, we, if there was a protective effect and we can understand the molecular mechanism underlying it, maybe we could come up with novel therapeutic targets that could ultimately be leveraged into new therapies. And so we started this quite a while ago with uh, Dr. Valemina in my lab at the time. Now he's a, a, a faculty member, but at the time he was a, a postdoc. And we did work uh, uh, that we published back in 2011, and we kind of primed the pump. Severe hypoxia one time uh, prior to subarachnoid hemorrhage, a day later, the animal, these are mice uh, with an animal model who got subarachnoid hemorrhage or a sham surgery. 
We did some testing neurologically. We then looked at vasospasm. And later we looked at things like microvessel thrombi and autoregulatory dysfunction and neuroinflammation. Um, but we looked at different endpoints. And we did, the first question was, does hypoxia alone protect? Does hypoxic conditioning protect? And it turns out it really did. Um, here's an example of the middle super artery, the diameter in a sham mouse. Here's the middle super artery three days after sub subarachnoid hemorrhage in, that, in a mouse. And you see here about a 30 to 40% reduction in, in the diameter of the middle super artery. So that's vasospasm. You see it depicted up here. But if you condition the animal with hypoxia, you lose the, uh, the vasospasm. It's protected. There are neurological deficits that go along with that. Uh, and the neuro score and the rotor rod are the two main ways that we do that in a mouse. And the red is the deficits. Here's the deficits in neuro score. Here's the deficits in rotor rod as compared to sham animals. But if you condition the animals who got subarachnoid hemorrhage with hypoxia, you would improve their neurologic outcome by both measures. So there was a phenotype here, a protective phenotype that was intriguing to us. And we wanted to then begin to understand uh, and translate this uh, uh, to a potential therapy. So the first order of business was translating it into something that made sense. You're never gonna have, you're never gonna have the opportunity to do something right before someone has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They're gonna present with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and you wanna see if conditioning-based therapy might be uh, effective. So we uh, changed our paradigm to hypoxia after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Turns out um, that the 8% oxygen for two hours, which is kind of moderate level of hypoxia, uh, started three hours after subarachnoid hemorrhage and repeated a couple of times. That turned out to be very protective. Um, and so here's data that shows that. If you focus in on this area here, that moderate hypoxia started three hours after subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is kind of the time window that IVTPA is given for ischemic stroke. Um, that that was strongly protective against vasospasm, turns out very protective against microvessel thrombi, and very protective, the, the maroon here, very protective against neurological deficit. So now the phenotype that we saw with hypoxia prior to subarachnoid hemorrhage, we're now seeing uh, when you start treatment after subarachnoid hemorrhage, which suggests that a conditioning-based therapy after subarachnoid hemorrhage has legs in terms of uh, uh, translating it to the clinic. Then we wanted to understand mechanism, um, and we started looking at something that's very uh, strongly associated with vasospasm, ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase that produces nitric oxide, which is a strong vasodilator. And we did a bunch of studies, but I'm going to show you the key study, which is uh, looking at an ENOS knockout mouse. So in a wild-type mouse that has ENOS uh, expressed normally, you see the vasospasm and you saw the protection with hypoxia. But if you did the same experiment in an ENOS knockout mouse, uh, there is no ENOS because it's been genetically deleted. Um, you, you lose the vasospasm protection and it turns out you lose the neurological protection. So it really suggested to us that ENOS was important in the protection that we were seeing. That's not novel, but it was gave biologic rev, uh, relevance to the, the observation that we had. The reason it's not novel is because people knew ENOS was involved. People have designed ENOS-directed therapies and nitric oxide-directed therapies, and they've been complicated by things like systemic uh, uh, hypotension that have led them to not be uh, appropriate uh, or effective uh, in, as, as a therapeutic for subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. But this gave us some biological relevance to what we were doing. So then we started looking upstream. What other, than e what other molecules other than ENOS are involved? Uh, and if we could find other molecules, that may be therapeutic targets that don't have some of the uh, uh, side effects that ENOS-directed therapies had, maybe we'd come up with a new, uh, a new therapy. And this is work that Ananth did along with a very talented postdoc at the time. Now she's a research instructor in my lab, Deepti Dewan. And we've now published uh, several papers showing uh, uh, that CERT1, CERT1 is a very important molecule uh, uh, in hypoxic conditioning and we think is now a therapeutic target. So some of the data that's, that was published in those three papers include, if you use hypoxia in a mouse, you'll see an upregulation of CERT1 activity. Uh, so that suggests that it's, it's responsive to hypoxia. So that might be a, a, a part of the reason why hypoxia is giving its protective effect. Uh, we then did a, a variety of studies, but I'm gonna show you the key study. We looked again, utilized genetic knockout mice. This time we genetically knocked out CERT1-1. Um, if you do that, a number of the protective effects that we normally see with hypoxia went away. So here to the left, you'll see that vasospasm in a wild type mouse that has CERT1-1, you see the vasospasm protection, but if you do the exact same experiment in the CERT1 knockout, you lose the vasospasm protection, similar to what you lost with ENOS knockout. So you lose the vasospasm protection, suggesting CERT1's involved. Same thing, if you have microvessel thrombi, which is up here, you, you have protection with hypoxia, 
But if you do the same experiment in a CERT1 knockout mouse, you lose the protection. The microvasa thrombi are the same um, in, in both groups. Again, CERT1's involved with that type of protection. This is a complicated graph, but um, if you have the neurological deficits down here with subarachnoid hemorrhage, the red square dot here, and you do that in a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage mouse that got conditioning, but in a knockout, the green open uh, triangles, you lose the protection. Uh, uh, here's the closed triangle here. That's the protection you see with hypoxia. Here's the open triangle where you lose the protection. So the CERT1 knockout mouse lost the vasospasm protection, lost the microvessel thrombi protection, lost the neurological protection that hypoxia had delivered really suggesting that CERT1 is, is important in the protection you're seeing. That's great, uh, but that's not a therapy. Uh, a therapy would be, can we mimic the protective effect of hypoxia by augmenting CERT1 expression or activation? We've done that, and this is a pharmacologic study where we used a strong CERT1 activator called resveratrol, RES. And what we saw here is if you deliver resveratrol three days after subarachnoid hemorrhage in a mouse, you see a similar degree of vasospasm protection, a similar degree of neurologic protection, that we had seen with hypoxia. So you can, we can mimic it by activating CERT1. That's a new therapy, that's novel. Um, we wanted to make sure that what we were seeing was truly from CERT1 and that happened. And so we did an additional experiment uh, using a, a pharmacologic inhibitor of CERT1 uh, to make sure that the, the effect we were seeing was really a CERT1 activation protective effect and it was. So the bottom line is, and I'm concluding here in the last couple of slides here, the bottom line with conditioning-based therapy and I, everything I've shown you has been with hypoxia. And so I'll conclude there, but I'll also make one com brief comment about a different uh, uh, conditioning agent, inhalational anesthetics in a, in a moment. But with hypoxic post conditioning, we've shown uh, uh, that it's very uh, robustly protective against neurovascular dysfunction like DCI. We've shown that that protection is ENOS mediated, but importantly, CERT1 mediated. And the reason that's important is, is it's a novel therapeutic target. We've shown that you can mimic the protective effect of hypoxic conditioning by augmenting CERT1. Turns out genetically, if you overexpress CERT1, you can also see the protection. So that again, suggests it's, a, it's, a, it's promising. And we're now uh, working on uh, some additional preclinical studies and beginning to uh, work with uh, 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 companies that have CERT1 activators uh, uh, in terms of how we can translate this into early phase clinical trials. Uh, something that we're very uh, 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 you know, kind of bullish on a, as a new therapeutic approach. Um, I'll just make one last comment. There's actually a series of papers that I didn't review today today uh, in this lecture for time reasons, where it turns out inhalational anesthetics can also show a similar amount of protection um, as a conditioning agent. And interestingly there, uh, uh, one of my colleagues has done some clinical studies uh, that also show that uh, uh, inhalational anesthetics as, of, as com uh, compared to intravenous uh, propofol uh, seems to be protective against vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia. So that's just a whole nother avenue that conditioning agents may be uh, apply, uh, applied to uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage patients in the future and something else we're, we're working on. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being the 32nd Holland Lecturer. It's a thrill to be with you. Glad to be here in person um, and uh, look forward to meeting with the residents a little bit later and uh, meeting with other uh, friends and colleagues uh, during my visit. So thanks so much and, and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful tour de force. Uh, three areas of clinical and basic science vascular. Um, I'm going to have to sign off at nine, but I wanted to open the discussion uh, with a couple of uh, questions. And um, maybe what we would do is first touch on the first aneurysm part, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a question about that. And then maybe uh, ask Dr. Fifi if she can comment on the dura levi fistula component, and then Dr. Kellner, if uh, you want to ask about the conditioning. All of these are fascinating. Uh, you know, one, one of the things I noticed is you did not mention the use of physiological monitoring. And I think that that does add a little bit because it, it's, a, it's a surrogate for quantitative flow. Um, I, in the ICA occlusion case that you showed, for example, if you had, <clears throat> use the Doppler, you would not have heard flow in the carotid, in the one where the, end, the clip was on the MCA. Um, if you'd use the Doppler, you would have seen that there was no flow through the ICA, and maybe you would have seen a drop off in direct cortical motor evokes, maybe not an SSCP. Right. But I think the, the, the point that you make, and I agree with, is that the more you do stuff, the better you get at it. 
And so if you are a team that is very comfortable with intraoperative angiography and you feel the quality is good and you know, it doesn't break the flow and so on, you're going to get great results with that. Um, you know, our, our experience, my experience has been that as you begin to concatenate all the different parameters you mentioned, you get better at, um, at, at defining those outcomes and those things that are, are done. But I really enjoyed hearing your approach to that. I think that's a good point. I think, uh, uh, and actually, it, it, it relates to my one of my final comments about the inhalational anesthetics. It, it turns out the you know we we actually don't do uh, physiologic monitoring on a routine basis on aneurysm uh, uh, cases, um, although other centers do, and it sounds like perhaps you you all do here. To do that, you need IV propofol. Uh, you you can't use inhalational anesthetics uh, uh, very well, um, and that. Uh, uh, if we're going to move down this road of inhalational anesthetics as a potential therapeutic approach, you know, especially uh, 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 intraoperatively, you know, the, you know, a balance of potential therapy versus the information that you get from physiologic monitoring would be uh, affected. So uh, it's an interesting point. Um, and, and, I, and, and I agree with you, uh, use of IC, you know, use of uh, uh, physiologic monitoring and also ICG or fluorescein may have uh, uh, May have been able, or, or actually, the the Charbel flow probe, or or the or the Doppler, may have been able to show a difference in, in the distal ICA and and, and avoided that uh, miss uh, by the ICG, as you mentioned. So, it just it, you know, it, it really just goes to make your emphasize your point that there's so many complexities, and uh, if you are trying to thread a needle of intraoperative conditioning using an inhalational agent, that may improve more than the information you get from physiological monitoring. Um, what, what I've loved recently is this use of continuous cortical motor evokes. Uh, we slip a subdural electrode on the cortex. The activation threshold is low. And so it's just like a continuous monitor. There's no twitching. Yeah. It's far more sensitive than, uh, than the usual uh, evoke potentials, but uh, really, really interesting. Joanna, do you have uh, any comments you want to make on on this? We, you know, we're doing a, quite a few uh, dural AV fistulas here. What 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 do you think about? Yeah, no, I I think um, uh, thanks, Dr. Zippo, for the, that those that interesting um, those papers and that those insights because I think that's exactly it. It kind of is exactly what we've been doing for for type ones. We're pretty conservative, except for perhaps CC fistulas, even, even for CC fistulas at times if vision isn't threatened, we've, we, they sometimes spontaneously thrombose without treatment, but uh, we're a little bit more aggressive with type ones. Uh, and then yeah, we've seen, you know, comment on uh, if the noise, you know, sometimes the tinnitus changes or clinical symptoms change, and that is, uh, the patient may think that everything's better, but you that should um, uh, kind of push you to, to do an angiogram because sometimes it does convert, uh, upgrade itself. Um, yeah, we have uh, a fair um, number of, of patients coming through, especially for some reason, and, and that may be something to look into is uh, genetics and, and um, and like ethnic variation, because we see a fair amount of patients, interestingly, from Queens coming in. Um, I would, I don't know if we've looked at it exactly, but, um, you know, compared to our, our uh, kind of spoke hospitals that are in Manhattan versus Queens, I would bet that we see more coming in from, from Queens, which is a different uh, ethnic variation. Um, uh, but yeah, we'd be interested to to hear about the consortium as well um, yeah i'm glad you bring up the genetics uh, one one couple things that we would like to do with condor is um, one make it prospective um, but you're going to require some funding to do that and we're, we're kind of trying to find ways that we might be able to do that um, and then uh, we also want to use condor to leverage it for clinical trials um, um, and i think that there's a couple of um, Areas that we're looking in, uh, we'd be looking into that, and then another one would be looking at the pathophysiology of dural AV fistulas. And genetics is a great way to go at that. Um, and so uh, uh, we have a neurogeneticist in our group of WashU PhD scientists um, that um, we're starting that. Uh, we're starting to collect blood uh, for DNA uh, on our own dural AV fistula patients, and are working on the kind of the 
to operationalize that to where we can use the, the database uh, large or the, the there's consortium largely to, to do that. And you can use things like cheek swabs, sing it out by FedEx, you, know, mm-hmm. you can do uh, electronic uh, uh, consents and things like that, where literally you could get a lot of uh, uh, DNA samples from a lot of these durable AV fistula patients um, and then start looking at uh, underlying uh, uh, pathophysiology, which would be interesting. So those are some things we'd like to do with the, with the condor. Joanna, do you have any idea how many fistulas we've created since, I don't know, the past six or seven years? Um, That'd be more than 200. We, we could, yeah, I would say more than 200. Yeah, we, we could look in our, our database, but yeah, we see, we see ruptures a lot. We see, we have via neural ophthalmology, we have a fair number of CC fistulas. Um, and so, yeah, I think it would be, I think 200 is a good estimate and maybe more. Yeah. So Mount Sinai is not in our consortium right now, <laughs> but we are actually, we actually, uh, we, we kind of, we had, we, we invited a certain group came in and then we kind of had to stop it because we had to it's, analyze our data. We did that, but we're actually have reopened it to now we've, there's three or four that are in process of being uh, uh, added to the consortium. So if you're at, at all interested, Joanna or anybody else, Chris, Please let me yeah. know, and, and I can get you in contact with the right people to do it. We, we have a pretty good retrospective database. I think. Is that right? That'd be great. We We'd love to have 200 more useful. in our in our database. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And then you have, just so you know, there's- Yeah, we have. And it, just so you know, the way it's done is that it's not like all the data is collected and then all the papers come out of Wash U. Like you saw, you know, we have a, a we have a kind of a, 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 a PI agreement in terms of how, uh, how the, da- the data is shared so everybody can uh, take, make use of it, so. I was going to comment. We also have a fair amount of pediatric uh, little fish lives that are, um, a, a, a little, a, you know, as you know, a little unique or um, that may may also fit in. Great. I'm going to thank uh, Lila again. I've got to sign off at nine, but there are more questions, and I invite the group to uh, stay and interact with Dr. Zipfel. Thank you, Lila. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Josh. Some people might sign off, but I'll selfishly ask another question. And then uh, if any residents have any questions, of course, uh, you can put in the chat or raise your hand here. Um, Is there a possibility of developing a preconditioning drug that could be used in acute stroke, where obviously you don't have time for preconditioning, but if you could activate those pathways in the acute situation, or is that not really possible? Chris, I'm gonna cut you off there. I'm sorry. I, I, my, my guest, my, my Mount Sinai guest internet paused for a moment. So I missed the okay, question. Okay. So I was saying, you, um, sorry. is there a way to leverage the preconditioning pathway that you've identified to treat acute stroke where you obviously don't have a preconditioning opportunity, but you can activate the pathway in the acute condition and, and potentially get some neuroprotection from that? Is it, is that? Yeah. Possible? Yeah. There actually, actually the, the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I, the, the, the kind of the, the terminology post conditioning where you're actually using a conditioning agent after the event, stroke, trauma, what have you, at least in the neuro world, uh, started with ischemic stroke. Uh, and so you would create a stroke and then they would repeat the ischemia or, or subject them to hypoxia and then you can have a protective effect. So, you know, and, and so I think absolutely. Um, and there's been, a, the issue there is then that's where the, at least in the neuro world, that's where the work has do, was dominated in the ischemic stroke and the problem was translating it, it has proven difficult. Um, so um, the search one pathway has already been uh, uh, to some degree evaluated in ischemic stroke. Uh, we, we have, a, I didn't talk about it and not really free to talk about it quite yet, but we have another molecule kind of upstream that uh, is less, uh, uh, has not been evaluated in ischemic stroke. So I think there's a, it's possible. I, I just, it's just, it's just a lot going on. You know, the ischemic stroke comes in, you got to have your IV TPA, you got to get your thrombectomy or, or combination and also have them put in a, uh, also a therapeutic agent. Uh, it, it's possible. I, I think more likely in my opinion would be, you know, um, you know, cabbages and cardiac, you know, and, and carotid arterectomies yeah. or, or, or things that, you know, have a known stroke risk, yeah. uh, ischemic stroke risk. That seems a more likely target for these, some of these approaches rather than yeah. trying to add this to everything else that's going on so fast uh, uh, in that uh, initial ischemic stroke period. And then do you have to 
preconditioned for a specific moment or can you remain in a preconditioned state? Could you give this to a patient who had a single stroke and is high risk for a second stroke, for example, you know, yeah. nursing homes could take it on a daily basis. Yeah. So there's been people, I haven't done a lot of this work, but there have been people who have really worked on kind of conditioning paradigms to how, how long can you extend this, this, uh, this conditioned or protective state? Uh, and you can, you can do it for, weeks and even months in animals uh, by repeating it, uh, repeating this um, uh, uh, conditioning uh, agent, you know, over, you know, so for example, you can have a conditioning a, a paradigm that does it over a month, and then you can extend out this protective phenotype for my understanding is, you know, two, three, four months after, the, after that period of time. And then some of these conditioning agents, I mean, I mentioned hypoxia, and it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it's a hammer, you know, in terms of a conditioning agent, but there's other ways to condition, you know, someone, or, or, you know, a patient in a much more benign way, you know, exercise, uh, 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 fasting, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, uh, limb, you know, remote limb ischemia where they, you know, briefly put on a cuff on your leg uh, for five, you know, minutes, you know, in, you know, over a period, there are different ways to kind of in a more gentle way, have a conditioning uh, effect. And I think that type of approach for certain conditions is something that, um, may have legs. Yeah. Um, well, now we've kept you quite a bit over time. Residents, any, any comments? Hi, Dr. Zippel. This is uh, Trevor Hardigan, one of the PGY4s. Um, just on the um, topic of uh, hypoxia and preconditioning, I was wondering if anyone has looked at or if you're familiar with anyone looking at uh, rates of subarachnoid hemorrhage in populations that live at altitude compared to those that don't, you know, presumably one could figure out rates of subarachnoid hemorrhage in, in yeah. most areas in the population, but like looking at like the Andes or even Colorado here in the, in the States, yeah. for instance, if there's different significant difference in rates. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I hadn't thought of that. Um, uh, everything that I've been talking about and everything that I'm aware of, um, in the conditioning world, as it relates to aneurysms or subarachnoid hemorrhage, has everything to do with uh, secondary brain injury after after the hemorrhage has occurred. What you're talking about, it sounds to me like, is uh, uh, is the actual you know the rupture rates of aneurysms or maybe even the formation of aneurysms, and, and whether you'd be protected against aneurysm formation or aneurysm rupture if you were in a high altitude state with kind of a chronic uh, uh, hypoxia conditioning type of uh, of environment versus people who aren't in that environment. That's a very interesting question um, and uh, would be kind of a nice, a nice natural experiment to do. I hadn't thought of that. What we, what we have thought about is subarachnoid hemorrhage patients that um, have underlying chronic conditions that might, uh, might have, uh, uh, that might, may have led them to be chronically hypoxic. So someone who's got, you know, sleep apnea uh, or someone who um, has a, uh, 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 you know, obstructive sleep, you know, obstructive sleep apnea and, and uh, or, or a chronic lung condition where they were kind of chronically hypoxic. Do those patients uh, develop less vasospasm or DCI after their subarachnoid hemorrhage than, than those who have not? I have a, a neuroanesthesiologist who, a colleague of mine in my lab who's looked at that and we haven't been able to sort that out. And I, I think my assessment of it is it's been tough to really find out if someone who has those kind of conditions is really hypoxic or whether they have those conditions, they're being treated and they're not really hypoxic, they just carry the diagnosis. So it's, it's a little messy. So we've tried to go at that a little bit, but I like the, uh, I like the high altitude. And, and, and it would be, if that was true, that would suggest that conditioning could not only affect brain injury after subarachnoid hemorrhage, could actually, but actually maybe have a role in brain aneurysm formation or brain aneurysm rupture itself, which would be really cool. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jorge. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good morning, Dr. Sifel. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, for My quick question is, uh, for Enos, you mentioned that uh, systemic hypotension uh, precluded the use of that molecule as a, as a treatment. Have you noticed any adverse effects uh, secondary to the pharmacological activation of uh, CERT-1 in, in your mice models? And, and you know, I think the, the answer would come from uh, knowing how, how much upstream in the molecular uh, pathway is CERT one compared to Enos? Yeah. If you could please elaborate on that, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So we we haven't done a lot of that, but companies who are really interested in CERT one activators for non aneurysm reasons and non non neurosurgical reasons have, 
and they seem to be very safe. They don't have the systemic hypotension um, that uh, that um, there's no really enos uh, you know agent, uh, but there are nitric oxide you know donors uh, and things of that nature um, that you know that that do have these uh, systemic uh, 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 impact on on blood pressure. But search one activators. Uh, from the companies that have some of these proprietary, really uh, high uh, uh, high potency SIRT1 activators, that, that isn't an issue, I'm told. Thank you. Good to see you again, Jorge. Same, sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Zippel.